Really enjoyed the scripture reading that Margie and Adam brought this morning. For those of you who don't know, you don't know how authentic that was. They were reading from Isaiah's prophecy, and they are Jewish. And in fact, Adam could have read the passage in Hebrew this morning. Uh, uh, and it's a very familiar passage uh, to the Jewish people. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, says the Lord. As Christians, we believe that the fulfillment of that prophecy takes place in the New Testament. And so I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of Mark. And in honor of the reading of God's Word, if you would stand one more time. This is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. And Mark says, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is the voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. This morning I want to preach a message called Rethinking Repentance. Rethinking Repentance. Just last month, actually less than a month ago, on November 16th, 2023, a 95-year-old African-American woman named Sarah Keyes Evans slipped into eternity from her hospital room in Brooklyn, New York. You probably have never heard of her, but... She enlisted in the Women's Army Corps in 1951, and she completed her training at Fort McClellan, Alabama, and was stationed at Fort Dix in New Jersey. I know Fort Dix. I was stationed there. One of the most miserable weeks of my life under a drill sergeant were spent at Fort Dix. As a private first class on October 1st, 1952, Keyes was traveling from Fort Dix to her family home in North Carolina. When the bus stopped to change drivers, the new bus driver demanded that Keyes relinquish her seat to a white Marine. Keyes was feeling tired, and it was midnight, and she politely declined. She was arrested and spent 13 hours in a jail cell in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina, and ordered to pay a $25 fine for disorderly contact, uh, conduct. Three years later, her court case was settled, and she won just months before Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to yield her seat to a white passenger. She was a forerunner. Meanwhile, in March of 1955, there was a young black teenager named Claudette Calvin who, refers to, who refused to give up her seat to a white person. These events took place nine months before Rosa Parks was arrested for the same offense. Calvin did not receive the same attention as she did because she was deemed to not have good hair and she was not fair-skinned. She was a teenager, and she was pregnant. The leaders of the civil rights movement tried to keep up appearance and make the most appealing protesters the ones who were most seen. But Calvin recalls that event and says, 
I remember the bus driver looking through the rearview mirror and asking me to get up for a white woman. She decided on that day that she was not going to move. She said, history kept me in my seat. I felt the hand of Harriet Tubman pushing down on one shoulder and Sojourner Truth pushing down on the other. Calvin was handcuffed, arrested, and forcibly removed from the bus. And it was just nine months later that Rosa Parks, who most of us have heard of, made her stand. She was a forerunner. Like Keyes and like Claudette Calvin, John the Baptist also didn't get the attention of his successor, Jesus. He was the bad-haired, locust, and wild honey eaten forerunner of Jesus Christ. But the forerunner of Jesus was important in the Gospels. Good histories don't forget about the forerunners. Mark, in fact, did you notice we started with Mark 1, and Mark never includes what we call the Christmas story. He doesn't even bother to tell us about Jesus in the manger. Matthew does and Luke does, but Mark doesn't. Mark is getting straight to the message, and he begins his message with the forerunner, John the Baptist. John the Baptist represents repentance, but my study of Mark chapter 1 and actually of Isaiah chapter 40 this week have had me rethinking repentance. Because John the Baptist represents repentance. Now, for those of you who are concerned with me as pastor, you're rethinking repentance. I'm not rethinking the importance of repentance. I'm not rethinking the necessity of repentance. I'm actually rethinking the tone of repentance. One thing you may not know about Pastor Melanie is that when we were in Illinois for a good 10-year run, she directed a musical around Easter that was the talk of our region. It was called Amazed. And she, we had seven performances, and, and every night the, the auditorium was completely filled, as we told with music and drama, the story of Jesus. And every year there was a scene of John the Baptist, and probably my most memorable John the Baptist character was Rick Macaluso. Rick had a big, thick beard, wavy hair. He was burly. And you heard him before you saw him. He would cry out in the auditorium, Repent! Repent for the kingdom of heaven! And the hairs would stand up on your arms. His voice was so loud. And indeed, from the scripture, we learn that John the Baptist does shout. But there's a couple reasons to shout. One reason to shout is because you're, you're mad. But another reason to shout, and it seems to me most likely from the reading of Isaiah and this, is that you've got good news to tell. John the, uh, the uh, in Isaiah 40 it says, speak comfortably, comfort my people. Say to them that their warfare is accomplished. The stereotype, I think, of repentance is kind of mad. You know, that repentance is kind of a mad or word. I don't know about you, but I can kind of picture an evangelist with their veins sticking out of their neck, calling you to repent. Turn or burn. Get right. Or get left. And one thing is very clear in the stereotype of repentance. God sure doesn't want you to have any fun. If you want to know if you're sinning or not, if it's a little bit fun, you're probably on the right track. But my study of this story has me rethinking the tone of repentance. And I asked myself three questions based on what I read from, chapter, from Mark chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 40. And the first question I had is, what if repentance 
is a call to rest rather than a call to get right. In other words, what if repentance is really good news? From the Message Bible in in Matthew chapter uh, 11, Jesus describes repentance this way. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Isn't that a beautiful image of repentance? And it makes me wonder, why did the people leave the cities and come out into the wilderness to hear John the Baptist by droves? Did they come out there to get a spanking? I don't think so. I don't know about you, but when it was time for spankings, I didn't run to it. I ran away from it, right? No, why are they running out into the wilderness? Because John is giving them good news, What if repentance and the things that hold us down are God's invitation for us to let go? Because we've been enslaved and to experience the life that we've always dreamed of. What if John wants us to know that God's not mad at us? Then I had another question. Because one of the ways that we think of John the Baptist is is we think of him, I always have this image of a bulldozer because every mountain shall be brought low and every valley shall be exalted. I picture before Miley Cyrus did, he came in like a wrecking ball. You know, that, that, that's, sort of the, that's sort of the idea of John the Baptist, that he sort of comes in like a wrecking ball, you know. And, uh, but, but I had another question after I read this passage, and my question was, What if repentance is a call to unclutter our lives so that Jesus can be seen? To take all of the mountains out of the way that are obstructing. In my prayer this morning, I prayed that in churches everywhere, that people would see Jesus, not Christianity, not our churches, but that people would see Jesus. What if this is a call to unclutter our lives? so that Jesus can be seen. When I was in second grade, my family moved to Ottawa, Illinois, where I spent my entire upbringing. And in Ottawa, Illinois, um, I was in second grade, and one of the young ladies in my class, kid at the time, second grade, was Rona Klassen. Rona was a Christian kid, and Rona and I were friends. She was just always one, she was just one of those friends all the way through school that was just always there. We weren't best friends, but we were friends, hung around in the same groups. And so from second grade all the way through high school, she was my friend. She would have been one of my longest friends that I've ever had. And then, like all of us, when we left high school that are my age, and maybe one or two people we kept track with, but we lost track, didn't we, of all the people we grew up with. Until someone invented Facebook, right? And so once I learned to sign up for Facebook, I started getting invites to become friends. And a lot of them were people that I knew when I was kids. And what do you know, Rona Klassen, but now her name was Rona Crail, showed up as a a request to become my friend on Facebook. So for the last, oh, I don't know, decade or so, we have been friends on Facebook, and I've now her husband has friended me, uh, Ted Crail, and um, Ted's uh, an interesting guy. He's uh, he's politically pretty liberal. He makes his views known on social media. He's a bit of an activist. He'll often like my post, however, and inbox me with questions or comments about something. 
And then just last month, um, Ted and Rona were going to make a trip to the Smoky Mountains, and they were going to be here on a Sunday. And they asked, you know, what time our services were, because they'd like to come by and come to church with us. And so, sure enough, Ted and Rona, my second grade friend, boy, that's intimidating, preaching to your second grade friend, um, showed up for church last month, and because we knew they were coming, Melanie fixed a wonderful lunch for them. It was the Sunday I was going to be preaching at Mount Moriah later that night, so we had just a little while in the afternoon to visit with them, so we had lunch and we visited with them. And um, after dinner, they wanted to talk to us, and they seemed very serious about it, and uh, Ted and Rona said, <clears throat> they kind of cleared their throat and said, <clears> throat> Um, we, we want you to know that we are, we are deconstructing our faith. We're deconstructing our... Th- by the way, that's a big word right now. You'll hear it a lot, deconstruction. There's books about it, podcasts about it. We're deconstructing our faith. And it, it's, it's a hard term to define, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean someone's losing their faith. It means that they're reevaluating their faith, their they're, they're, they're trying to figure out what was gold, silver, and precious stones, and what was wood, hay, and stubble. And, and people are doing different things with deconstructing. Some are leaving the church altogether. And so we see America is increasingly becoming like Europe because there's a lot of people who are using... We, we, we didn't have... That. By the way, I think anyone who has had faith has had times when they've deconstructed their faith. We just didn't have language for it. When I, was in, when I was in college, I deconstructed my faith, the, the faith of my, of my fathers and some of the, some of the legalism that I, was, I grew up with, we let go of and we changed. And fortunately, I had some mature mentors along the way that helped me. And, and in the middle of it, I never lost Jesus, you know what I mean? And, uh, but but deconstruction is kind of a word, but they wanted to let me know. And they said, well, we haven't been back to church since COVID and um, Rona said, I'm watching online. Um, and they talked about their disappointment with the evangelical church. And they, and they invited me to join a Facebook, but because they said, but they, but they said, but Phil, we, we think you're different. We, you seem like you love everybody. And, you know, we read your posts and all of that. And, and, and it's not like some of what we're experiencing in church. And they invited me to become a part of a Facebook group um, called the New Evangelicals, and by the by the name, the New Evangelicals, it sounds like evangelicals are sort of reevaluating these. But so I joined the group, and wow, it's like the Wild West in there. I mean, there's atheists, there's agnostics, there's uh, people that are still very uh, committed to church. There's um, uh, different sexual orientations in the group. It's a very diverse kind of a group and and now I'm in it and they said we want you to be in the group because we think you could help some people in there well man I I remember just making a comment or two on some people's posts and man when they found out two things one that I'm a male and one that I'm a pastor wow I got some I got some pushback let's just put it that way but I'm not saying that in a critical way. I'm saying that there's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of hurt people out there. And, um, and so then I wrote a post um, of my own where I talked about the evangelicalism that I grew up with and Wheaton College that very much um, loved science and honored science and, uh, uh, and, that, and that we didn't have to be cookie cutters in order to... Uh, to be Christians, and the the evangelicalism I grew up with was very different from what I'm some what I, you all are describing to me today. And then people start. I got like I've got over a hundred people that have that have uh, come in on that particular post. A lot of them that are sort of my age and saying, "Yes, I remember those days, and I remember that." But but one guy posted what what he thought the the typical, by the way, this is a, supposedly an artificial intelligence uh, image of what 
the most evangelical church looks like. So you look at that. So this is like an a artificial of the most evangelical church. See all the American flag. Now you want to see what the most evangelical pastor looks like? Here you go. How about that, right? That's the most evangelical pastor. And then the most evangelical missionary. The most evangelical missionary. So, so a lot of these people that are in there are... are um, reacting against sort of a Christian nationalism that, that, that is being experienced uh, in the church these days. But the, the comment that really got me was a guy my age who also went to a college just like mine. He went to Biola University like Wheaton and had a very similar experience. And he told me, in 2019, I quit attending church altogether because I could no longer find Jesus there. What a tragedy it would be if we could no longer find Jesus in the church. What if John the Baptist was not just a turn or burn guy, but what if he was saying, get everything out of the way. All your Christian nationalism, all your prosperity gospel, all of that thing that is turning people away from God and the church today. What if you got rid of all of that and we could once again see Jesus? Wow. What if, what if that's what John the Baptist was all about? Because I got to tell you, church, all of these years later, I'm still in love with Jesus. I love Jesus. If you want to know what kind of church this is, this is a Jesus church. This is a church that honors Jesus and wants Jesus to be seen in everything. Finally, from this passage, what if repentance is the launching pad to being filled with the power of Jesus? I think the church has looked at repentance as the be-all, end-all. That Man, if we could just get people to repent, walk the aisle, raise their hand, get them baptized, and then just kind of hang on until Jesus comes. It's interesting that John the Baptist's ministry takes place in the wilderness, Adam and Margie would be familiar with how significant wilderness is to the Jewish thinking. Because Egypt was synonymous with slavery, but wilderness was this in-between place between the promised land, slavery where they had come from, and the promised land where they were going to, and wilderness was this place of cleansing and preparation and repentance and all of that, but it's not the be-all, end-all. And as I, as I studied this passage, I thought, you know, too many Christians are just living in the wilderness. You know, we've come out of slavery. We've asked Jesus to forgive us of our sins, and some of us used to do, but, you know, sometimes Christians look miserable. I'm just hanging on until Jesus comes. You know? It's just, it's just like all the good stuff's in the future. But what if repentance is more than that? You're in a church that believes that repentance is a doorway into the spirit-filled life. Acts 2.38 says, repent and be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In Acts chapter 19, there was a, a group of believers. They believed on Jesus. And the apostles came across them and said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? They said, we haven't even heard that there is one. We haven't even heard that, that, that there is a Holy Spirit. And, and, and they said, well, then what were you baptized? They said, we were baptized into John's baptism. John's baptism of repentance. We repented. We, we came out of our slavery and into the wilderness. And, and, and at that point, they were baptized and received the gift of the Holy Spirit. I just really believe that God wanted me to come here on this second Sunday of Advent 
and tell you that you don't have to wait till heaven for all the good stuff. That the Holy Spirit wants to fill you now. That, that, that God's promises are for you and the things that we saw in the New Testament and the, and the joy that they had in the New Testament, that whatever you're going through, you can have, you know, my daughter's been fighting this battle with cancer. You know what the overwhelming comments I get about my daughter who's, who's, who's facing a breast cancer is, is, is the Holy Spirit that's shining through her through all of that time through all of her blogging and encouragement. And, and, and it doesn't mean that she's not like some fakey, you know, every day is a holiday and every meal is a feast. No, she gets, she gets sick. She gets all of those kinds of things. But let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit has come. And John the Baptist said, what I've got, you know, it's good. I'm not even worthy to get down and unlatch the shoes of what's getting ready to come. Amen. Get ready. I think John was saying, get ready, get ready, get ready. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit's coming, amen. I think that would be a good outline for the rest of my life, that what I ought to be about. I ought to be about sharing that repentance is a call to rest. I ought to be about sharing that repentance is a call to unclutter our lives so that Jesus can be seen. And I ought to be about inviting people into the Spirit-filled life where the Scripture says you can have joy unspeakable, and you can have peace that passes understanding. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen.